Good afternoon, everyone, or at least I should say good afternoon to those of you who are on the East Coast, the Eastern Time Zone, as I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. My name is Warren Smith, and I'm the Vice President for Mission Advancement of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. And it's a real pleasure and honor, in fact, for me to be with you today for the next hour on this webinar to talk about Oz Guinness's new book, Carpe Diem, redeemed. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to uh, bring Oz more fully into the conversation, but before um, I do that, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items I would like to mention to you that I think will make the next hour and the time afterwards even uh, go a little bit better. Uh, number one is that we are recording this session. And whether you are watching live or whether you are watching via recording, please know that that link that we will share with you that has this recording is yours to share with others. We want this hour to be not only a time in which you are educated and encouraged by Oz Guinness and the ideas that he's going to share with us, but we want this to be an equipping tool as well, uh, a tool that you can use with people in your sphere of influence. So please just consider this our permission, our permission here at the Colson Center, uh, to share this link uh, in whatever way you want with people in your sphere of influence. If you're a pastor, feel free to share it with your congregation, an elder or a deacon the same. If you lead a small group Bible study, or if you're a parent, a homeschool co-op leader, uh, no extra permission necessary. Feel free to share this with whomever uh, you want. However, one of the benefits of being here live with us is that you get to ask us some questions. And depending upon the device you're using, you'll find a little box that just says Q&A on your screen. If you click that box, the box will open up. And I'll see those questions here where I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. And after Oz and I have interacted for about 25 or 30 minutes, we'll throw the floor open to some of those questions. So let me encourage you, go ahead and start asking questions as they come up. My experience is that we will get far more questions that we will, than we will have an opportunity to answer. So the earlier you get your question in, the more likely it is that we'll be able to get uh, to your question over the course of the uh, last half of our hour together. So with that little bit of introduction, let me uh, introduce to you Oz Guinness. You know, I've, I've often uh, been at events where people will say, my next guest or my next speaker needs no introduction and then proceeds to spend about 10 minutes introducing the next speaker. I'm not gonna do that with Oz Guinness um, because I know that many of you, especially those of you in the Colson Center sphere of influence, are already well acquainted with him. We use Oz Guinness's books, especially The Call in our Colson Fellows program. Oz has been a speaker at our Wilberforce Weekend in the past and, in fact, will be a speaker for us in 2020, in May of 2020, at our next Wilberforce Weekend as well. He's written many great books, including The Call, which I just mentioned. A Free People's Suicide is another book of the more recent uh, variety that has had a meaningful impact on me and um, many of us here at the Colson Center. And now today we are discussing his book, Carpe Diem Redeemed. So Oz Guinness, welcome uh, to the webinar. Thanks again for your strong support and active involvement with the Colson Center over the years. We are grateful for it. Great privilege, Warren, to join you. You know how much I appreciate Chuck Colson himself and the Colson Center and all you're doing. So magnificent. Privilege to be with you. Well, thank you so much. And let's just dive straight into your book, Oz. Uh, you know, I, I, I found it uh, nourishing in many ways. And one of the things that you often do in your books, which I find especially uh, beneficial, is that you get us to see the truth of Scripture in new ways. I, I sometimes describe Oz Guinness as that man who helps us to see um, those things that are hiding in plain sight. And um, you um, have done that in this book regarding the concept of time. Why is the concept of time so important, and uh, why did you want to write this book about it? Well, I didn't put this in the book, but the background of my thinking is we're at a stage in the crisis of Western civilization, as well as the crisis here in the American Republic, when many of the foundations are being challenged and torn up. And I think part of our contribution as followers of Jesus is to relay the foundations. You know, human dignity, freedom, justice, and 
things like that, along with the gospel. And one of them is clearly the biblical view of time and history, which is so much richer and deeper than any other. So that's what my book's about, relaying the foundations in terms of understanding time and history. Well, Oz, uh, you describe three ways of looking at time. You talk about the cyclical understanding of time. You talk about a chronological understanding of time and a covenantal understanding of time. Would you unpack those three ideas for us, where they came from, and why uh, the biblical understanding of time, the covenantal understanding of time, is so different and so important? Well, if you think the three great families of faiths in our modern world are the Eastern, the biblical, and the secularist. Well, the biblical really should be Abrahamic, somewhat including Islam. But the Eastern, Hinduism, Buddhism, the New Age movements, their view of time is typified by the wheel, going round and round and round. Desire leads to attachment, craving, which binds us to the wheel. And so the goal is to escape this cycle of suffering on the wheel and go back through uh, salvation and release from the wheel to the ground of being. And so you don't have a strong view of history. Freedom is freedom from individuality, not freedom to be an individual. And that, that view is the cyclical view, what the Hindus call reincarnation, which Nietzsche called the eternal recurrence. And, you know, Milan Kundera talks of the incredible weight of it, because what you do now will depend on all the hundreds of reincarnations that you have to come. It's, it's actually not a high view of either human dignity or history itself. It didn't give rise to science, didn't give rise to human rights, and so on. The biblical view is, is what is called covenantal. Under the providence of God, there is purpose in history, but we are called to be partners with him. When we come to know him, trust him, and obey him, we become partners and help to work out his purposes in history. The chronological view is the secularist. It's really the biblical view shorn of the supernatural. There's no supernatural, no providence, no purpose. So history is just what the atheists and others will make of it. It's a do-it-yourself endeavor. You have optimistic versions. You have Stephen Pinker at Harvard. Things are still getting better and better and better, although fewer and fewer people agree with him. And then you have the pessimist people like Samuel Beckett and so on who say that if life is short, and that's all we have, and the only rehearsal for life is life itself, then as Kundera says again, there's an unbearable lightness of being. It doesn't mean mm. much. Obviously, the biblical view is the richest and deepest. And we need to think of it and truly live in the light of it. Well, as these uh, various views of time, especially the covenantal view, really brings into sharp focus um, uh, some important truths of Scripture as well. You've already mentioned them briefly, um, but I'd like for you to say more about that. Uh, the covenantal view of time, for example, um, uh, it produces a very high view of man, of mankind. Uh, mankind is being made in the image of God. Mankind is having a purpose in, uh, in sort of God's economy and the way God has uh, made the earth and, and how the world is unfolding, how the universe is unfolding. So can you say um, a, a little more about that, this relationship between the covenantal view of time and this idea of human dignity? Well, that is so important because you think of you as yeah, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was taken as the Bible of human rights, even for secularist people. And now, just as we are considered post-truth, the words of the economists, really coming back to Nietzsche, we are increasingly, people aren't aware of this yet, we're increasingly post-rights. In other words, what is the foundation for why there's a worth of dignity in humans? And the only strong root of that is Genesis Declaration, which is called the Magna Carta of Humanity, that humans are made in the image and likeness of God. In other words, take say freedom. God is sovereign. Christians say to me, 
God doesn't have an interest in freedom, but that's what sovereignty is. He can express and exert his will despite restraint, despite interference, despite everything, because he's sovereign. And we're not sovereign, but made in his image, we are significant. We have choice and we're consequential. Our choices have results. And so you have a very high view of individuality, of freedom, of responsibility, of consequential um, significance, and so on. That's in Genesis. I lost your sound, I'm afraid. I, I'm sorry, Oz. Yes, I, you did lose sound for just a moment. I apologize for that. That was my fault. Uh, one of the, um, what, the 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 beauties of this live medium, but also sometimes one of the challenges of it is we have technical difficulties. But I apologize for that. Yes. Well, Oz, what you just said um, brings into focus your first chapter, which you call uh, singular, significant, and special. And I'm assume that's what you're getting at there. That that when we have a biblical covenantal understanding of time it means that mankind and the war and the purposes of mankind understood in in that through that biblical lens are indeed that they're significant and special absolutely and you see how history is completely changed you think of the pop song where just dust blown in the wind or shakespeare's Macbeth. It, life is just a tale told by an idiot or joseph heller's History is just a trash bag of coincidences blown up wind. And the Christian and the Jews say, no, there is providence, there is purpose in history. And we can do as our lives are short. Often they'll be incomplete in terms of the dreams and aspirations we have. Even the great Moses didn't cross into the promised land and so on. But there's always purpose and fulfillment. And that's the wonder of Christian, the biblical view of human significance. Well, Oz, um, it also, I think, for those of us who are modern Christians, and by modern, I, I, I don't mean that in sort of the technical sense of the word, but those of us who are living now, we'll say contemporary Christians, um, it, it really highlights for us the importance, I think, of studying history uh, as well, that God um, intervened in time. The incarnation is uh, is a, you know, sort of the, a classic example of God intervening entering time and um if if that would if time and history are important to god and to jesus it should probably be as important to us what you're saying is absolutely vital warren you you know today say the younger generation has no particular interest in history and that is absolute folly because you can see a great difference here between the greeks and the bible in the greeks you think of god as far as they were reaching for him in terms of philosophy and systems of rationality. But in the Bible, you can see we meet God in experience through encounters in history. And so you have that stress, remember, 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 and never forget, never forget. And so this isn't just a matter of mental recall. This is a matter of faithfulness and obedience and history to a nation is as important as memory to an individual. And you think of the tragedy of dementia. Someone with dementia has no sense of identity. And a nation without a sense of history is experiencing a form of cultural dementia. And that's the tragedy of both my own country, England, but also the United States today. There's an appalling lack of history. Mm. Well, uh, let's um, talk a little bit uh, more about maybe aspects of time that uh, people are very familiar with, um, but you unpack in, um, I think, some new and interesting ways in your book. Uh, You know, we often talk about the tyranny of time or of not having enough time. Um, You address uh, those questions uh, in your book. Can you say more about that? Well, on the one hand, we need to understand why, because we're living in a world of fast light, 24-7 24-7 pressure, which has been shaped by clocks. People didn't have, they had the shortness of life, but not the pressure of fast life, which has come through clocks. So I've got a chapter in sort of understanding that. Both the obvious things, 
that 24-7 pressure, but the less obvious, the way the time shape, you take the notion of progressive. Everyone today wants to be progressive. You don't want to be reactionary, Neanderthal, and so on. But behind that, as you know, C.S. Lewis and his friends said, there's a, the danger of chronological snobbery and so on. And we've got to examine that because there are a lot of Christians who want to be so relevant that they think that being up to date has to be the important thing. And they betray the gospel in trying to be relevant in that way. So there are obvious elements of time, the fast life, and there are less obvious elements of time through our clock culture. We need to understand them all because we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Mm. Well, uh, let me let me push back on that idea just a little bit, because uh, we, we are in the world and not of the world. We should study history. And yet uh, one of the subtitles of your book, or a part of the subtitle of your, of your book, is that uh, we should also discern the times, that we should understand the time that we are in and be able to apply a biblical worldview, the truth of Scripture, to that time we were in. So it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, Oz, that you're describing really at least uh, this side of eternity, not a problem that we solve, but a dilemma that we manage in the sort of, or or we look at through the lens of Scripture. Am I getting close to what you're trying to get at there? Absolutely. In other words, as Paul says, we will always see through a glass darkly. So we are not as modern rationalists who think you can predict the future in business or politics or whatever with certainty. No. But you can also see, you take the men of Issachar who followed David, skilled in reading the signs of the times. So the whole notion of a prophetic discerner. To take a verse which is one of my favorites in Acts 13, where Paul gives an incredible tribute to King David, and he says, David after he'd served God's purpose in his generation, fell asleep, died. In other words, it's assumed that we can understand some, although we see through a glass darkly, we understand enough of the signs of our times and the purposes of God in our generation to engage ourselves in a thoughtful, responsible way. And that's what I'm after. Now we, we've got trouble. We don't know everything. So I, I often make fun of friends who are pundits who speak in business conferences, uh, risk management and all these sort of things. Rationalism. We'll always see through a glass darkly, but we're responsible for living in the times in which we live. Um, Oz, let me, uh, forgive me for uh, um, breaking in here, but I think if you could lean in just a little bit in your talks, we're getting some feedback that um, that some of your words are not being picked up. But let me let me go ahead and ask a question about that. And, it, and in some ways, it's a little bit of a pivot in our conversation, uh, because we do live in both time and eternity. Uh, C.S. Lewis famously said that, ha- uh, has it ever occurred to you that you've never met a mere mortal? that we will all uh, live forever. And yet we have in God's sovereignty and God's providence only this limited amount of time here on this earth living in the way that we are living. And if if I may, Oz, um, ask you this, I see a theme, I think, um, carried out in this book that maybe you began 20 or even 30 years ago, which is this idea of the importance of living a purposeful life, of, of redeeming time by having um, a calling, a vocation on your life. Am I making this up, or am I manufacturing this, or, or bringing two ideas that maybe, uh, am I reading too much into this, or am I getting it right? No, no, you're, you're at the heart of things. And actually, in the first draft of this book, I had a chapter that really reco- uh, it went over the same ground as my, my book, The Call but it was too similar, so I cut it out. You're exactly right. The way we, in other words, the first chapter we haven't touched. Life is short. Life is fragile. Life is vulnerable. So we've got to make the most of it. That's the idea of carpe diem, which comes from the word to pluck in Latin, plucking fruit, and so on. And clearly the deepest way to do that is to enter into the purpose that God has made us for with the gifts he's given us, 
which is through that notion of calling. So that is absolutely central. You're dead right. Well, given that, uh, I want to read uh, something from, I believe it was the, it's the introduction of your book that, that really struck out at me. You say, my argument here is simple, straightforward, and a sure way forward. Seizing the day and making the most of life must not be flaunted in the face of impossibility or absurdity. The ideal requires a vision of life. That, that's right. That's the se- yeah, the secular view. And you, you go on to say the ideal requires a vision of life capable of fulfilling it. And that, I argue, can best be found within an ultimate belief, a faith, a relationship, a trust that justice to the deepest meaning of time, of history, and of human significance and enterprise. In other words, it sounds like what's underlying that is a fundamental belief that God is sovereign and that God is good. Absolutely. That's the covenantal view. So my idea for the book came when I read uh, an atheist Australian philosopher writing on this. And you boil it down, basically grab it while you can. And if you only have a secular view of life, three score years and 10, give or take a few, you better get on with it and grab it while you can. But I thought, my goodness, what an impoverished view. And so if you look at the secular, uh, the uh, Eastern view on one side, that cyclical view, and then contrast, uh, contrast is always the mother of clarity, one of my mm. principles in apologetics. Then you look at the atheist view, say it's Samuel Beckett and others. The biblical view is so rich and deep. You come back with gratitude and wonder and then plunge into the challenge of living at one's calling and fulfilling it. Well, so Oz, um, we live in a world uh, that is uh, bounded by time, so to speak. In other words, God um, existed before time. Uh, There is uh, a moment where we will have the end of the age and we will all live together, uh, those of us who are believers, those of us who are Christians, with God. But within this moment, um, this is a a unique moment, I guess. And and it's even hard to talk about this because the language that I use is language that is sort of self-referential, right? I use things like moment and time. Uh, and yet, um, in God's sovereignty, he did, he did put us here in time. Um, but I do want to ask, is, is there any sense in which time is a consequence of the fall? Or is it your view that time is, in God's sovereignty, a gift to us? Well, in my view, and certain issues like this, when we say we're speculating with Bible, doesn't start it out. We have to say we're speculating, my idea, or whatever. I think time was part of creation, not part of the fall. I think things like sin and death and judgment are the results of the fall, but not time per se. But obviously, in a fallen world, time hits us harder than it would if the world was not fallen. But beyond that, we have to speculate. But you mentioned the time words in the Bible, the hour, the moment, the year. The Bible is full of a sense of time, and it's one thing that's often lacking among Christians today, that sense of the urgency created, the notion of kairos, the crisis, the opportunity, the moment to seize at the flood, as Shakespeare puts it. You know, we need to capture that because we are living at a most extraordinary time in history, which we need to discern as far as we're able. Well, Oz, I want to open up the floor to questions in about five minutes or so, but let me kind of pivot to towards the end of your book, where you start to offer uh, some, um, shall we say, prescriptions. I think I, I don't want to be too reductionist in the way I describe at the end of your book, uh, so maybe prescriptions is not quite the right word, and I'll let you describe uh, the way you want to. But you, but you say, for example, that um, there are ways to seize the day. There are things that we can do as believers to seize the day. You make the point that the end is not the end. Uh, that um, that you know we need to live in a, as I mentioned earlier, not only uh, live uh, in ways that uh, make the most of the time that we've given, but also 
uh, to live in a sense of eternity and live in a sense of purpose. Can you say more about that and uh, maybe some practical suggestions so, uh, for those of us who are watching and listening for how we can carpe diem, seize the day in a redeemed manner? Well, let's just pick up the one that you mentioned there, Warren. The end is not the end, which I actually first understood through reading Paul Nebo. Because many Christians today in the West, not in the global South, but in the West, are plainly discouraged. The West's in decline. The church is not doing that well in many, many places. And there's a discouragement as one of the responses to the modern world. And one of the great things about the biblical view of time is that the end is not the end. In other words, as Nebo says, there's two meanings to the word end. It can either be end as conclusion full stop, period. And that happens all the time. The end of the summer, death, whatever it is. Everything ends in a fallen world in that way. But the other meaning of the word end in the scripture is not the Latin word finis, but the Greek word telos, the end as objective, culmination, climax. And every mm. time there's an ending, say the Roman Empire fell, the West may fall. God has purposes in and through and beyond our human endings. And that's why we should be really hopeful today. So St. Augustine was terrific. The city of God would outlast the city of man. Now, we need to have some such equivalent hope as we look at the end of the West or whatever today, so that we are people with tremendous hope without any discouragement and defeatism. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, this idea of the incarnation, not not the idea of the incarnation, the reality of the incarnation as, uh, as you know, not only is it, of course, the central event in Scripture, I mean, it sort of divides uh, Scripture, Old and New Testament, um, as, as a practical matter, but it is also sort of the defining moment in world history as well. That event, that event of the incarnation, that event of God becoming man and living here on earth, um, in some ways is the uh, energizing event um, of the gospel, obviously, but also of your book, I would think, in some ways as well. Absolutely. And we can say in the Old Testament that Sinai is the decisive event, the Exodus, and our Lord talks in the transfiguration of his Exodus, which some versions talk about his departure, that's far too weak. But the Exodus, that founding liberation for humanity in the incarnation and the cross and the resurrection, as you said, and here we are living in the light of that. So we're living between the Lord's first coming and his second coming. So we live looking forward with tremendous hope. And so what we're doing, we trust, is a sign of where we're going when the kingdom is fulfilled. And where we're going, when Jesus comes again, gives strength to what we're doing here and now. And so we are very definitely living in that time in between. And we should be people of strong and confident hope because of the first coming and then the second coming of our Lord. Mm, wow. Well, as we've um, gone almost to the bottom of the hour, and we've got a lot of questions, so I want to uh, dive into a few of the questions that we've already received. Before I do that, though, I would just like to remind everyone that um, Oz Guinness's new book, uh, Carpe Diem Redeemed, is uh, the offer that the Colson Center is making this month for a gift of any size to the Colson Center. It's one of the reasons that we wanted to do this webinar today with Oz to introduce you to the book, and uh, if I may say it so plainly, to whet your appetite for wanting to get a copy of this book and read it for yourself, because the ideas in that book are far richer, far more nourishing, and uh, far more interesting than we can cover during the very short period of time that we have here. And I do strongly recommend that you get the book. It's real easy to get it. I'll say more at the end of the hour about how you can do that. But let me just say briefly that if you go to our website, at breakpoint.org, uh, you will see a tab right on the front page that will um, allow you to click through and get a copy of Osvid Guinness's new book, Carpe Diem Redeemed. And I should also say that you're going to get it before um, most everybody else. Oz, I don't think the book is quite out yet, is it? It's uh, due out in a couple of weeks, is that right? Technically, I'm the 24th. 
Yeah, that's right. So you'll get a little bit of an advanced uh, look at it if you go to breakpoint.org as well. And Oz, we've got questions from just all over uh, the map, so to speak, uh, especially uh, uh, sort of philosophically and uh, practically. So let me just begin. John asked this. Um, and uh, something that we've not really talked about, but I think it's a really interesting question, so I'm going to pose it to you. According to the quadrivium, geometry is the study of numbers in space. Music is the study of numbers in time. Uh, and astronomy is the study of numbers in space and time. So would you comment on the role that playing music, enjoying music, listening to music, or for that matter, astronomy and the other uh, sciences and arts play in helping us uh, the carpe diem, seize the day in a redeemed manner? No, that's a, a very, very interesting question. And the depth of it, I think my good friend John Lennox, professor of mathematics at Oxford, he would be the better person to ask in that because it is a marvel how numbers underlie so much of the mystery and the wonder of the universe the Lord has created. So I think you're absolutely right in that description, which is a famous one, and I've read that too. I would just say the wonder of today we must, uh, in the day of the crisis of words for images and the valuation of words in the social media, we should be people of words who know the richness and depths of words. At the same time, thank the Lord for music, which often, as you put it in that saying, allows us to say the unsayable. You know, but that's a hugely deep question, which I appreciate. And let me just yeah. say what a privilege it is to speak to you wherever you are, around the country or around the world. Well, yeah, it's a marvel this technology is for us. And it is, uh, you know, one of the advantages, Oz, of living in the time uh, in which we live, that in, that in God's sovereignty and God's providence, he allows us these tools and gifts. But I think it's also fair to say, um, and, and, and Kenneth um, sort of says this uh, flat out in, in his question, that there are other aspects of living in this year of our Lord 2019 that are maybe not quite so positive, that we are seeing a lot of um, uh, problems and struggles related to marriage, gender identity, the value of human life. Um, and uh, so he asked the question, um, uh, is this time um, uh, an urgent time for us? And, and, and by that, uh, I think he also means an especially urgent time uh, for us. And if so, um, what should we do about that? And if not, why not? That's a question that goes far beyond our discussion this morning. You know, I argue yep. elsewhere that we are living post Auschwitz post Hiroshima and pre singularity. You could unpack unpack each of those in great depth. In other words, this is a moment of incredible crisis for humanity. And even you take our atheist friends, they've gone from the Enlightenment humanism towards a post humanism and even then what's called an anti humanism and now through technology a transhumanism. They're all different. We could spell out each of those. But as C.S. Lewis put it, we've moved from the conquest of nature to the conquest of human nature. And we're approaching the must, what Lewis called the master generation, the generation whose effects on human nature could affect all human future generations, here's the key point, without their consent. Mm -hmm. It's the most extraordinary time. And there's no other faith from the Jews and Christians with their biblical faith that has the foundational truths and ethics that allows us to engage constructively with this urgent moment we're living in. So if ever we needed to discern the times of today, it is our generation. As, uh, Don asked this question, um, given, given the pace of modern day living, the volume of knowledge via social media, or at least the knowledge of the volume of information, I'm not sure that it's knowledge and wisdom, but it's certainly information via social media, um, the, 
the remote control speeding up the interaction between the human agent and the outside world, um, how can we slow things down um, to reflect, to ponder, uh, to attain the rest um, that um, the Bible calls us to? Um, do you have any perspective on that and any maybe advice and counsel on these issues as well? Well, overall, we can't. The ele- escalator, the whatever you like to call it, is speeding up. We can't slow the world down. But we can live biblically and Christianly in the midst of it. And clearly, one of the things is that rhythm of work and rest that we have right back in Genesis. In other words, six days work and the Shabbat, the Sabbath, the rest. And Christians need to recover that. And I, I have to say myself, you know, often I approach that with, either one extreme guilt, not doing it as it should be done, or a kind of legalism, it should be done this way and everyone else should do it this way, and so on, to capture that sense of rest. And of course, it isn't just weekly, it's every seven years, and every seven times seven, and the Jubilee year, and so on. There's a tremendous amount for us to re-explore in that whole notion of rest and Sabbath in the scripture. And if ever we needed that, it's now in the craziness of fast life. Well, Oz, can you say a little more about this idea of the Lord's Day or the Sabbath uh, day? Because uh, I, you know, I think that there's uh, uh, that there are a lot of even Christians who would um, argue that um, it's not as important uh, as um, uh, as maybe you're making it out to be here. Um, that it's that 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 any observance of the Sabbath um, is legalistic in some way, and yet what I'm also seeing, um, I think, is um, a sense that that perspective is um, not enough. Um, I've, I've I've read in your book and this book, the Carpe Diem Redeemed, um, you promoted a very high view of the Lord's Day and the Sabbath and this idea of rest, and and this is from the guy who um, believes that um, work is sacred, that that work is a gift from God. And uh, I've read other books recently. Are are evangelicals recovering this idea? A few, a few. You know, when I was a boy, you could see, particularly in countries like, say, Scotland, there really was a legalism. Everything stopped, everyone watched, and so on. And in the name of freedom, all that was thrown out. But you can see today, because of the drivenness and the anxiety, people know they need to break that reliance on looking at their phone or answering their emails or whatever. And people are taking a, a rest from that. They, they need it. They know they want it. But of course, that's what Genesis and the Torah as a whole called us to from the beginning. So on the one hand, we've got to look at the craziness of modern life and what it's doing to us in terms of drivenness. And then it, when we really understand that, go back and re-explore scripture. And it's not a matter of legalism and laying burdens on each other, but a matter of freedom. And, and, you know, Rabbi Sachs, the utopia now, it's not the full freedom that will come in the Messianic age, but it's a breaking through. So everybody stopped. The slaves didn't have to slave, even the animals didn't have to do their work, the oxen and so on. It was a risk breaking into the rhythm of hard work. We need to recover that. Most people today, certainly the advanced modern world, we know desperately how much we need that. Hmm. You know, as you begin your book with a famous old Chinese proverb, which um, goes like this, if you want to know what water is, the fish is the last thing to ask. And um, and I I I think you be, began your book with that quote for strategic reason. And if not, I'm going to um, ask you uh, to say more about that. And and I think I think it might be because we humans who live in time um, are not very reflective about time. We don't really think about time and um, the uh, the importance of time in our lives. Uh, is is that part of the reason why you began your book that way? No, I'm sorry. I didn't begin the book that way, but that particular chapter that way. I began the book with a 
the story that I absolutely love on the train, but that's another one. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, you're right. This is, that's right. That's the beginning of chapter one, but you're right. Your book began, um, the introduction of your book began with that story of that on that train. Would you recount that story very briefly? Well, I was coming back on the Eurostar from Brussels to London, and you come into some Pancras Station dilapidated buildings, splattered with graffiti, and there was some that you really could read. And you only, the idea was you only live once. It was an expression of the YOLO philosophy, which around many of the American campuses briefly, but people who followed it, which is a kind of bastardized version of Epicurus, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, they forgot the original formulation had a sting in its tail. You only live once, if then. In other words, a lot of people experience the shortness of life. They never know how to live well and wisely. Mm. And that is the challenge that we as followers of Jesus, we have the answer to. There's a lot of people floundering around today in terms of carpe diem, but we're the ones with the deepest, richest answer. And it's a point of being able to share in terms of witnessing to the Lord. But above all, it should shape the way we live differently in our culture. Now, at times, you said fish and water is the medium in which we live. So it's one of the great mysteries of life, along with, say, evil or the scientific discussion of consciousness. You know, these are mysteries, and time will always be a mystery. And I think Augustine said it best. When no one asks you what it is, you're pretty clear about what it is. But as soon as someone asks you to say exactly what time is, as he said, he was unable to say. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, you uh, introduced an idea just in that last answer, Oz, that um, it strikes me as at the heart of of your work and also of the body of work that you've created. And that is, uh, and, and, and also, uh, I'm going to mispronounce your name. I apologize for doing, for doing so, but uh, G-A, G-B-O-Y-E-G-A, Boyega, I'm going to guess, go, but, uh, ask the question about the relationship between happiness and some of the ideas that we're talking about now. You, may, you talked about the good life. Um, uh, and it strikes me that uh, a lot of what you've, you're saying in this book, and as I said, in your past books, is that there really is a relationship to having a purpose in life, understanding why and how we are to spend our time here for God's glory and for human flourishing, and this idea of, of happiness and actually living a good and purposeful and meaningful life. Um, is that relationship uh, part of what you're getting at here in this book? Absolutely. But, you know, there's a huge difference in happiness and joy. Mm-hmm. So happiness depends on circumstances. And you do have some of that in the scriptures, like the word blessed is very close to happiness. But joy is different. And as Jews point out, the Feast of Sukkot, you know, the Feast of the Booths or the Shelters, in that precarious situation as they crossed the wilderness and so on, they were called to celebrate with joy because joy was in the Lord and things ultimate, although there wasn't any particular happiness at the time. But of course, both of them finally come for the follower of Jesus through that notion of calling as we trust and obey him and enter into his purpose for our lives and exercise the gifts he's given us engaged with the world. There is an immense amount of Joy. Well, Oz, uh, you know Chuck Colson, um, uh, your your friend and my, and uh, our mentor here at the Colson Center, um, often talked about um, the idea of being a happy warrior. Uh, that yes, we are not to be uh, lethargic. That we are to be, you know, he would often say, stay at your post and do your duty. But this idea of the good life, this idea of, of, of going about your, your, your work, even in dark times, with great joy, uh, seemed to be at the center of Chuck's teachings, and it also seems to be at the center of what you're trying to get at here. And that leads me to one other question that kind of relates to this as well. Um, in my mind, uh, th- this, uh, this uh, questioner, by the way, chose not to leave his name, and that's just fine. In my mind, there is uh, such a sense of urgency now 
uh, that it is easy to feel driven to do something to restore our disintegrating culture. Um, you touched on this idea of rest and the Sabbath, which are vital. Uh, how can one lessen this sense of being driven, um, I, which I would maybe say is a fear-based sense, and move more uh, into that um, uh, that kind of a good life that is characterized more by love and joy, especially in this dark time in which we live, where the problems that we face are ever present. I'm afraid we've lost your sound. Can you um, kind of can you lean in just as something happened? Oh, alas. No, unfortunately, Oz, the sound is still not there. Yeah, the sound has dropped out altogether, I'm afraid, Oz. Okay. Well, friends, uh, Oz, thank, let, I, I hate to end us in such an abrupt way, uh, but we are, in fact, uh, nearing the end of our hour together, so we were going to have to put a limit on this uh, robust conversation anyway. So I apologize, though, that, it, that we had to end it in, in the way that we are. But please know, Oz Guinness, that we are so grateful to you for being a part of uh, this webinar. I'm sorry we had to end it uh, as we are, but uh, we are grateful for your book. Uh, there's no way we were going to be able to cover all of the issues in your book anyway, so we are um, – um, I guess we'll just say, let's stipulate for the record, go get a copy of Oz Guinness's new book, Carpe Diem Redeemed, and you'll be able to explore uh, these ideas at your leisure in a rich and robust way. Uh, the easiest, simplest way uh, for you to get a copy of that book is to simply go to the website of the Colson Center, which is breakpoint.org. That's breakpoint.org, and on the front page, uh, of that website, you'll see a, a, either a pop-up menu or a button that will allow you to click and uh, leave us uh, some information uh, that we'll need in order to send that book to you. So for a gift of any size uh, during the month of uh, September, we will send you a copy of Oz Guinness's book, Carpe Diem Redeemed. So, Oz, again, I apologize for the unceremonious ending. Uh, it sounds like you can still hear me, or I can see by the expression on your face that you can still hear me. So um, uh, just accept our grateful, um, uh, our gratitude, our appreciation uh, for this book, for a lifetime of great books and faithful ministry to the Lord. And um, just know that um, that uh, we appreciate you and that we are uh, going to um, use this book um, for God's glory, we pray and hope in the life and ministry of the Colson Center. So with that, friends, again, apologize for this abrupt ending, but uh, thank you again for all of you for being here. There we go. And um, uh, go to breakpoint.org to get a copy of Oz Guinness's um, new book, uh, Carpe Diem Redeemed. And while you're there, click the tab at the top of the page that says Wilberforce Weekend. And that'll take you to our May of 2020 uh, event, which we are fond of calling the uh, Family Reunion of the Colson Center. And I mentioned that event in this context because Oz Guinness will be one of our keynote speakers, and we're really excited to have Oz for that weekend face-to-face, -face, live and in person. So make sure you check that out. Again, God bless you um, all for watching and listening. Thank you for your time, for prioritizing this hour uh, for this event. And Oz, again, thank you as well. God bless you, and everyone have a great afternoon. Goodbye.